everybody. Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn, and it's my great honor and privilege to get to share this grace encounter with you today. I hope that you are uh, making it through Blackberry winter okay. I just came inside from covering up my potatoes and uh, praying for a bunch of grace because it's supposed to get really close uh, cold tonight. <laughs> All right, I want to talk to you today about um, calling the enemy's bluff. Now, uh, to bluff is simply to show confidence or a pretense of strength that is put on to deceive or to mislead others. And I'm going to read you a scripture out of John chapter 8 and verse 44, and this is something that Jesus spoke. He said, you are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. Now, he was speaking to the Jews and the Pharisees who were challenging him uh, about some of the things that he had done, uh, especially dealing with the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. And so he says, you're of your father the devil, the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie... He speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So when Jesus, who is the very word of God made flesh, and who has declared that he is the way, the truth, and the life, when he says that there is no truth in the devil, then that means there is no truth in in him so in order to walk in our capacity in this earth as believers and as kings and priests in order to be used of god to make a difference this is one of the truths that we have to nail down if the devil's mouth is moving there's a lie in it somewhere and we have to believe that we have to understand that or we will not be able to resist him effectively because he'll be able to who do us i mean when he showed up talking to adam and eve in the garden it was all smooth and just asking questions to kind of set your mind to pondering and that's one of the ways that he gains access a lot of times is just by asking questions well if you don't know biblical answers to those questions if you don't know what took place when Jesus died on the cross and what he redeemed you from and what he has redeemed you into, then it's going to be very difficult to answer those uh, challenges and not be suckered in by them. 1 Peter chapter 5, I want to read you verses 6 through 9. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, I want to throw this in here and, and not charge you for it. There are so many Christians that are still laboring under the idea that about the time they get their head above water, God's going to smack them down under to try to teach them something. Please hear this. Humble yourself, uh, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now, he does not want us exalting ourselves, but he's like any father that is delighted in his child. He wants to lift that child up. So God wants to exalt us and lift us up in due time. But he's a wise father, and he's not going to lift us up and put us in positions of authority and put us in uh, places where our, our maturity is not where we can handle it. There, I've heard a lot of times people talking about your anointing taking you where your character can't keep you. <laughs> we don't want that. We want to develop our character in the Lord. But if we listen to his wisdom, that's what happens. So we're not supposed to be seeking to promote ourselves. But we're not supposed to be resisting whenever the Lord is trying to promote us. So the safeguard here is submit yourself unto the Lord. There are so many blessings and benefits that kick into place in our lives when we learn the secret to and the art of just submitting to the Lord. And it's as simple as starting your prayer by saying, Lord, here I am. 
I thank you for the way that you love me, but I know I can't do anything without you. So I'm here to ask for your wisdom. That's submitting to the Lord. It's that easy. It's admitting we don't know everything and that we're willing to learn. That's what meekness means. So to humble ourselves is to submit to his wisdom, to submit to his ways that are higher than our ways because he knows how the spirit world operates. He knows how the kingdom is supposed to operate. He knows what his good plans are for us. So when we submit ourselves to that, we're already showing wisdom. So humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. He is determined to lift us up. And how do we do this? There's a colon there for the next verse. It says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I cannot stress this enough. Part of our humbling ourselves is learning to every day cast our cares on the Lord. He does not want us consumed with cares. Now, why? God's not on an ego trip. He's not just trying to make life hard on us. But the scripture tells us in Mark chapter 4 and verse 19 that when the cares of this life enter in, they choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Now that's bad because the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. And if you're full of cares, you can be speaking the word of God out your mouth, but it be producing absolutely no results because the care has choked it and you've become like a parrot or a puppet and you're just saying what you've heard other people say or you say what you know you've been trained to say, you're giving mental assent to it. But your spirit and soul is not all engaged together because the back of your mind, you're worried about something. You're caring about something. So every day it is a good practice to take a few moments and just get quiet in the presence of the Lord and tell him, Father, this bugs me. And I'm here to talk to you about it. I want to cast the care of it over on you. Or Lord, this hurt my feelings. And I know it shouldn't hurt my feelings, but it hurt my feelings. Talk to him about everything. Tell him when something makes you angry. Tell him when you're struggling with unforgiveness. Tell him those things. That's how we cast that care on him. And when we do that, then that safeguards us against the word becoming unfruitful in us because we need the word of God. It is seed and we need the seeds of healing. We need the seeds of deliverance. We need the seeds of hope. We need the seeds of joy. We need the seeds of the kingdom producing after their kind. We need that word bringing forth fruit when we speak it. We don't want to play around with the care. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 tells us that we overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And that means our words that are agreeing with God's word. Our profession lining up with the high priest of our profession, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Our words and what we're saying about God's word is vital to making our stand in these last days. So we overcame by the blood of the Lamb, our testimony about what that blood has done, our words, and we love not our lives unto the death. There's a generation of people that's waking up and realizing that there's more at stake than preserving self. That's another care. Cast that care over on the Lord and he'll take care of things. So cast all your care on him for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now, the scriptures already told us that the devil, the cause of that old serpent, the dragon. So it didn't say he was a lion. He said he's walking around as one. Devil is from the Greek word diabolos, and it means literally false accuser, slanderer, Satan, devil. So here we've got this dragon trying to act like a lion. So he's already operating in a level of deception. But not just any old lion. He's acting like a roaring lion. Now what is he roaring? He's roaring accusations. 
accusations against you, accusations against God, accusation against the promises of God, accusation against other people. He just, every time he opens his mouth, he's lying and accusing. He doesn't know any other language. When you see him going and standing before God and talking about Job, what was he doing? He was accusing Job. When you see him in the book of Zechariah going in and talking about the high priest Joshua, what was he doing? Accusing. That's all, that's all he knows how to do. And that's the reason that Revelation 12 is such a joy to us because when the accuser of the brethren is cast down, that, that's a big thing for us. And we overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. So he's going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, if he has to seek, that automatically tells us that there are some people that he cannot successfully devour. He has to be looking for it. Seeking is from the Greek word zeteo, and it means to seek, to plot against life. Wow. So if you ever had any questions about the devil's intentions, that right there ought to settle them. Because I don't care what kind of pretty glittery package he may show himself up in your circumstances, what he may be trying to lure you with, there's always a death hook in it, and he's always after your life. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now this is one of the things a lot of times that it's hard for us to come to grips with because whenever the enemy is assaulting us, it's so easy to get to feeling like we are the only one going through this. Nobody understands how I'm feeling. Ah. He loves to pull that woe is me self pity card. <laughs> And we have to learn not to play into that. That's, that's one of the deceptions. Because we're not the only one going through this. Every child of God on this planet deals with this at one time or other because he plays the same record over and over and over again. But the scripture tells us to resist him. And resist is just from the Greek word anthistome, and it simply means to stand against, oppose him. Don't just stand there and let him run you over. Oppose him. Well, how do I oppose somebody who I cannot see, but who's shooting all these darts into my mind and planting these thoughts, and my flesh wants to agree with these thoughts? How do I resist that? Well, steadfast, which means solid, strong, sure, but it says resist him steadfast in the faith, not just any old faith. The faith, the definite article, meaning a specific faith. When you read about faith in the New Covenant, when it talks about faith, it's always in reference, or nearly always. There's a time or two that it isn't. But it's nearly always talking about being justified or cleared of guilt, made righteous by faith in the blood of Jesus and what he did at the cross. So your faith is faith in the belief in the truth that we're justified, made righteous. So we have to resist him standing steadfast, unmovable, refusing to budge off that truth. So we learn something from this right here. Every lie, every accusation that he brings to your thinking is going to be in direct opposition to the truths of redemption. Now where he has bought himself time and where he has gained ground that he should never have gained is because he caused Christians to lose sight of what really happened at the cross. And if you don't know what you're redeemed from or what you're redeemed into, if you don't know what your inheritance is, then he's going to roar at you with accusations. He's always going to start with some sort of guilt and condemnation. You're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. You're never going to overcome this, yeah, 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 which is always making it all about you instead of all about Jesus. And once he gets you it's struggling with the guilt and the condemnation, then he's going to start bringing you some lying symptoms. And if you don't learn to recognize that for what it is, then he will do his best to kill you with an ingrown toenail. But I 
have to remind you, and I have to be reminded myself, we have been made kings and priests by the blood of Jesus. We do not have to bow to his lies. We're delivered from the authority of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. We're seated in heavenly places far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, including the name of the accuser, and we have power of attorney to use Jesus' name, his blood, his word, and his spirit to resist that rat and put him on the road. But he's bought himself time because so many times Christians have confused being submitted to God with being passive. You can't be passive and be a warrior. And we're still fighting the good fight of faith. So we gotta, we got to learn to discern the difference between these two. And that's the reason God sends teachings like this, so that we can understand it, so that we can grab the truth and rise up in it and walk in it. Do you know that Satan absolutely does not respect your denomination or lack thereof? There's some people who take great pride in having no denomination. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with having a denomination. But Satan doesn't respect that. He does not respect our good intentions. He does not respect our church attendance, our tithe giving, singing in the choir, visiting the widows and the orphans. He doesn't respect any of the churchy things that we may be involved in. He respects, reluctantly, but he respects nothing except what the blood of Jesus has accomplished for us. We've been made kings and priests so that we can spread the salt and the light and the life of the kingdom here in the earth. Now, everything that the enemy does, he does to oppose that. So we have to learn to call his bluff because he was stripped. He has been judged, and I'm going to read you that again, and I'm going to read it and read it and read it and read it until we finally get a revelation of it. He has been judged, and now shall he be cast out. That is his destiny. He cannot escape it. God is raising up a generation of priests now that are delighted to give him his marching orders every time they catch him trying to meddle in something. Standing and hollering, I rebuke you, Satan, is not going to move him. If you don't know what your covenant purchased for you and what the blood of Jesus has done for you, holler and I rebuke you, it's not going to move him. You're just going to get wore out. And he that tickles him because he knows when that happens, it's going to cause you to question the truthfulness of the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus and the word of God. So we've got to learn what belongs to us. When God said my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, he wasn't joking. Satan works very hard at robbing us of information because he knows the power of information. He knows the power of seeds. He knows things are going to grow and become greater. So we have to choose to hang on to that. Let me read you John chapter 12 and verses 26 through 32. Jesus is speaking and he said, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am... There shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now, another word for minister is servant. Another word for minister is priest. We've been made priests. Isaiah, the scripture tells us in the book of Isaiah that men are going to call us priests of the Lord, the ministers of the Lord, priests, okay? So serving, ministering, being a priest. If you're focused on following him one day at a time, you're going to wind up where he is. No, no problems. You don't have to try to figure it out. You just have to seek to be close to him every day. And it's as easy as getting along with him for a few minutes and saying, Lord, direct my steps today. I, I seek your wisdom. I, I have no idea what's going to be thrown at me today, but I know you're ready for anything. That simple. You're geared and ready to go. He said, now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this hour, this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it 
and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, I've shared this before in a previous broadcast. Go back and read this 12th chapter of John. Jesus was talking about his crucifixion here. And when he's talking in relation to that, when he says, now is the judgment of this world, we have to understand God made a judicial decision at the cross. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. All of the sin of all of humanity, past, present, and future, was put on him, and it was judged at the cross and the devil came out on the short end of the stick god ruled in favor of humanity and against the accuser and that's good news i don't care what day of the week it is but we've not known that we've not had revelation of that we've not based our prayer and our thanksgiving and our worship on that but that's what belongs to us. That's the truth. And that's one of those lie, one of those things that he tries to use a lie to bluff his way around to buy himself more time and opportunity to wreak havoc in the lives of the saints. So the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, according to the scriptures, in God's dimension. Before the foundation of the world, it was done deal. But it's been a done deal in this earth for 2,021 years. And we're still stumbling along because we have not understood what it meant. That he's been judged. And now he is to be cast out. John 16, Jesus is still talking. This is right before he goes into the garden to suffer his passion and be betrayed and go on to the cross for us. John 16, starting at verse 7, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient, or it's to your advantage for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they, the world, believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. So he convinces the world of sin. He convinces the believers of righteousness. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. He is judged. And the saints are supposed to be executing judgment, carrying out the judgments that are written against him. Well, how in the world can they do that if they don't even know what they are? How can they stand up in the defense of people who have been reconciled to God by the death of Jesus but don't know it yet? How can they minister the goodness of God? How can they minister priestly blessing in spite of what the people are doing at the moment? Because everything has already been taken care of at the cross. How can they do the exceeding abundant grace? that's greater than the sin. How can they walk in that? How can they make their decisions based on that if they don't even know or really believe that the prince of this world is already judged and now he's to be cast out? Jesus said, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. <laughs> oh, goodness. How be it? And when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, remember, the devil is a liar and the father of it. The thing that we have to combat and to call his bluff, the equipment that God gave us is the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. You might as well just get used to that. You're going to be having dreams and visions. You're going to be having nudges. We are in the last days. We're in the outpouring of the Spirit, and Holy Spirit is going to show you things to come. If you're His kid, it's going to happen. Deal with it. He shall glorify me, for He shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore said I that He shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. God's not trying to keep us in the dark. 
God wants us to know what belongs to us. God wants us to know how to function as kings and priests. He wants us to know how to effectively resist the dragon when he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Not just resist him for our sake, but resist him on behalf of people that don't know how to resist him. Because Jesus paid the price and the penalty to redeem all of us. But there's been such a selfishness that has consumed the church that we have been so content to sit inside the four walls of our church or to stay in the salt shaker, so to speak. We've not been terribly concerned about getting out and sharing people or sharing with people the unconditional love of God that is so rich and so vast and so deep that he sent his own son to be made sin with our sins so we could be made the righteousness of God in him so that grace could reign through that righteousness unto eternal life. Oh my goodness, the scripture is so full of wonderful truths that the church is just pretty much, a great many of them completely ignorant of those truths. Let me read you Hebrews chapter 4. And this is something that the Lord drew my attention to the other day. Now, this is one of my favorite passages. I love this. I depend on this. If I'm praying for people, whether I'm praying for the sick or if I'm praying somebody that's oppressed in their mind or, or just, just basic needing some help and some grace, I stand in this word. But he ministered something to me the other day, and I realized, wow, I'd never seen that before. That's the reason I tell you so many times, the Word of God's alive. I don't care how many times you've read it. God can always show you something fresh, something new. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Now that's what he got me with. He didn't say seeing then that we have a great and mighty king, although that's equally true. But the emphasis here is seeing that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens. Now, why is that important? Well, because God has determined he's going to have a kingdom of priests. And he's determined that those priests are going to minister to him, to bless in his name, and try every controversy and every stroke with their words. Priests are going to operate in the government of God in this earth. And they're doing it from a place of spiritual dominion, not bloodshed, physical violence, dominion. Do you see the difference? Seeing that we've got this great high priest that's passed into the heavens, let us hold fast our profession. Here we go with those words. We've got to be speaking in agreement with what Jesus has done. Well, we can't if we don't know what he's done. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore, because all this is true, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Wow. We're not coming to the throne of vengeance. We're not coming to the throne of retaliation, uh, except in the sense of grace. We're not coming to the throne of hate and anger. We're coming to the throne of grace. We're coming to the throne where love reigns. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Does this generation need help? Yes, it does. We are to be functioning in this earth as a nation of priests because we have this great high priest in the heavens. He's concerned about the souls and the lives of men. He told us he didn't come to destroy men's lives but to save them. He didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. God the Father was in Jesus the Son, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto, that, unto them. The church has got to swallow that. We have got to be okay with that if we're going to function in the things that God's called us to do as kings and priests. We've got to know what the sacrifice provided and then we're going to have to be willing and be bold enough to start calling Satan's bluff every time. The father of lies cannot hold out against the spirit of truth. 
He cannot hold out against the sword of the Spirit when it's wielded by somebody who knows what the blood of Jesus has accomplished and what that blood is testifying in the presence of the Father. Let me bless you. The Lord bless you and create upon your dwelling place a cloud by day and a fire by night that every assault by the enemy may be repelled by the manifest presence of God. The Lord bless you and make you of quick understanding in the things of the kingdom that you may take your place and do his will in this generation. The Lord cause you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. The Lord protect you and your family from all evil. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and just bless you going out, bless you coming in, cause you to taste and see that God is good, saturate your soul with his abundance so that you can become a river of living water pouring forth to minister to thirsty people. Let us pray. Father, you are, you're so kind, you're so good, you're so determined to help us understand these things that we've not understood in the past. And I appreciate your being so patient and so willing to teach us. And I know sometimes, Father, that these things are, if we've never heard them, they seem outrageous, they seem unbelievable. So I pray for the people's hearts and minds, Lord, because this is your thing, this is your deal that you're doing. And you've told us that there's a great multitude that rises up out of the time of trouble that have made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. So somebody's going to believe it. But I pray for the people, Lord, for the eyes of the understanding to be open. Continue to pour out your Spirit upon us. Continue, Father, to quicken us according to your Word and according to your loving kindness. According, Lord, to your righteousness, help us to awaken to righteousness, to lay aside every weight and the sin that has beset us in the past, to become so full of a fresh revelation and fresh vision of you, Lord, that nothing else matters, that all of it falls by the wayside, and that we can truly say, not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord, I have been transformed, I am raised up. I can walk as a king and a priest in this earth because Jesus lives in me. Let this take root in the hearts of the people, Father. I thank you so much for your great desire to bless. And I thank you that I'm beginning to see the evidence of people being willing to open up and receive blessing. Thank you so much for that. That just ministers to my heart on so many levels. But I praise you, Lord, for what you're doing, and I commend this audience into your hands and into your grace, trusting you to accomplish your purpose. We give you the praise, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, dear friend, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I will talk to you later.